Here in Carp P4, you are witnessing the capture of a carp, but from a different angle, beneath the surface. In the previous carp fever videos, we looked at rigs and baits and many other facets of carp fishing. The lakes we fish were specially selected to demonstrate different methods, and we're sure you'll agree that the varied techniques used on different venues produce some lovely fish. In this programme, we'd like you to share with us a side of carp fishing not normally captured on film, that of the meeting of carp and man in the fish's own environment, plus an in-depth look at rigs from beneath the surface, and finally, the exhilarating experience of catching a huge carp on the top. But first let's go for some fun fishing at Linear's Poplar Lake. It's a hard fish water, well into the season, and the carp are very wary of floating baits. Floater fishing can be great fun and very rewarding, but it can also be very frustrating. In this fairly open water, the fish are very cautious, especially later in the season like now. They will often hoover up all the loose offerings, but as usual, the hook bait is treated with utmost caution. Now is the time to look for an area where the fish feels safe. In this next sequence, you will see me fishing such a place, a swim surrounded by dense reed beds and submerged branches. It's the type of spot ignored by most anglers, but with the right tackle and correct approach, we should be able to extract a fish without causing it any harm. One. 
I don't give it any more line, it's in the reeds. Oh, it's going through the reed bed now. Unfortunately, I've got to bully this fish a little bit. Keep it up on top if I can. Oh! God! Down there, more reeds. This is touch and go, this is. Oh dear. It's not a huge fish, but it's fighting well. I can keep it on top. This really is going. Just look at that rod bending. The trouble is, there's so much weed and reeds and everything in here. Very awkward swim. Hardly anywhere to put the net in. Oh, it's a beautiful fish too. There it comes just over the net now. Got it. Oh, that's a cracker, that is. Very pretty fish. Oh, it's hooked in the side there. There we are. The floater too, lovely. Better put him back. Right, I just thought you'd like to see exactly what I was using when we caught that fish. Um, we've got a controller on the line, sliding, which is stopped by a, a small ring. That's just obviously to enable casting. Uh, the main line is 11 sill cast, but the hook link is 7 pounds, mainly because this water is very hard fished and the fish are quite shy of the hook baits. So it's a lighter hook link, as light as I dare go with lilies reeds and soft weed about. I'm not using a bait. Now you might say, well what are you using? I'm actually using a cork ball. And the beauty of that is, at a glance the fish think it's a mixer. And they don't know it's not a mixer until of course they've taken it in and tasted it. And the beauty of these cork balls is that you can use one of them all day long. You not continually keep changing the bait. Uh, my favourites are from Ival Products, but there are several makes of these and they are available from all good specialist shops. Their main use is, of course, for moulding pop-up boilies around. And basically we just cut a groove in the cork ball and push it onto the shank of the hook. And I'm using Partridge Cassian hook, quite a strong hook because of the snags we were encountering. For most of my carp fishing I use the Shimano Dire Flash 12 foot 3 pound test curve rods which you'll see us using later on in the program. But for this capture I use the Twin Power 11 foot 2 pound test curve rod which has got plenty of action, nice for close range fishing. My favourite reel, the Bait Runner Aero, the new double handled Dyna Balance model. Terrific reel and that's what I use today.
My brother David and I are qualified divers and now we would like to take you below the surface into the world of the carp. This won't necessarily help you catch more fish, but it will give you an insight into what before has been the unknown. Our first look is a brief one at Alder Lake at Linear Fisheries, one of the waters we visited in Carp Fever 2. Later, I will be taking you into the famous Bedfordshire Carp Water, Withypool, before trying to catch one of its huge fish on floater. Here at Linear, these gravel bars are a main feature of the lake, harbouring much food and therefore favoured by the carp and of course the carp angler. After location of fish, rigs are normally the next most important part of successful carp fishing. On today's hard fish waters, it is often difficult to come up with a rig that will catch lots of fish. One of the carp angler's nightmares is the presence of blanket weed, so we are going under the surface to look at exactly what happens when the rig lands amongst the dreaded blanket weed. The purpose of this is not to show lots of technical rigs, but to illustrate exactly what happens to the setup as it lands in slightly different spots on the lake bed. The first rig I'm going to show is an old favourite of mine. It's a three ounce fixed lead and it's fixed, or semi fixed we should say, by this rubber which fits tightly over the swivel but the eye of the lead is, is moving. It can actually pull free should the lead get snagged or should the main line get cut. Also on the same swivel is another piece of uh, tubing which protects the hook link from any possible damage caused by the lead. It's a nylon hook link of about 12 inches. On the end here we've got a Z11 partridge herring hook and a small piece of silicon rubber on the hook which I tie the hair to and then I can move the rubber up and down the hook to have the hair coming off in different positions about a quarter of an inch hair and a 15 mil sinking boilie and that's one of my favourite rigs, still catches lots of fish today because it's a nylon hook link, it never tangles and we'll cast this one out into the lake and see exactly what happens to it Here we see the rig land on a clean gravel patch. You can clearly see the pop-up standing about three inches off the bottom, but the nylon hook link is difficult to see. The lead and short length of rubber tubing are also visible, although you should always remember that what the fish feels is often far more important than what it sees. By wafting a hand near the setup, you can see the movement of bait that is likely to occur when an active fish is close by. In this next shot, you can see the same rig, but this time with a sinking boilie, which still stands out remarkably well against the bottom. Here we show the same rig once more, with sinking boilie, but look how it's ended up when cast into a little blanket weed. The hook is caught up, and the rig is unlikely to work when the bait is taken. We're using a pop-up this time, anchored down by a small shot about two and a half inches up the hook link. You can also use lead putty or something similar. Up near the swivel we've got again a piece of tubing to protect the hook link from possible damage caused by the lead. But above it this time we've got a long piece of anti-tangle tubing which is always slightly longer than the hook link. It's a breakaway lead still, three ounces so it's nice and safe for the fish 
and that's the second rig we're going to use. In this first sequence, the rig is cast to a gravel bar, but the bait just happens to land on a small patch of weed. Had this been a sinking boilie, presentation would have been poor. You can clearly see the hook and how the silkworm hook link is far more visible than the nylon used earlier. When wafted, see how easy it is for the carefully balanced bait to move about. The longer anti-tangle tubing is more visible, but in this case the main line has not yet been tightened up. A small amount of Christon heavy metal or similar weight can be fixed halfway along the tubing and again at its end to make sure it's held well down. This will eliminate the possibility of line bites and the fish feeling line and tubing against its body. Here the same rig with pop up lands on shallow blanket weed and air can be seen escaping from the tubing. Once again, providing the tubing is kept flush with the bottom, this presentation is fine. We are now in deeper water at the bottom of the trough alongside the bar where there is thicker weed. This sinking boilie has ended up in the weed along with the hook giving extremely poor presentation. However, as soon as the sinker is replaced by a pop-up, the bait and hook sink more slowly and the hook is clear of the weed, allowing much better presentation. In this final sequence you can see what often happens when baiting a bar heavily with boilies. Some of them roll down the slope and collect in groups. Interesting, isn't it? This is what loses us fish. Branches completely covered in mussels. If your line so much as touches these, it's good by carp. Swan mussels, zebra mussels and pea mussels everywhere. Look at this little fellow, welcomed by the carp but not the carp angler. Crayfish thrive in good quality water and provide a highly nutritious diet for the carp. These, together with the mussels and other natural foods like bloodworm, shrimp and snail, are what make the fishing so difficult on a rich water like this. We nicknamed this one Reggie, as it spent so much time inside its hull. Further along the margins at Withy Pool, we find the results of untidy anglers. Litter can look just as unsightly on the lake bed as it does on the bank. And here is a large can that nature is taking over. A rusting home for hundreds of shellfish. This is more interesting, a small area cleared by feeding carp, a good place to put a bait. If only these areas were as easy to locate from the bank.
tadpoles, hundreds of them. Unlike frog tadpoles, these ones are not liked by the carp and soon they will be changing into toads. Further down the slope, we see what amounts to big trouble for the angler. Old branches covered with razor sharp muscles. Just look at this. This is one that won't cause the anglers any further problems. A good job done. Now this is an area we would expect to find carp. But maybe they heard us coming. Another submerged tree. At first we see only a small perch. But under these branches we find one of Britain's rarest fish. We've disturbed him and he's clumsily swam into some blanket weed. It's the Wells catfish. This one's about three feet long and weighs perhaps 12 pounds. He's not happy about us being in his cavernous home and who could blame him? He even refuses to shake hands. This is amazing. An area cleaned up by feeding carp directly under a large overhanging willow. Look at it, almost a perfect rectangle. It's firm clay and there's not much natural food left. It's an ideal spot to place a bait and several huge carp have been hooked right here. Ah, our first sighting of a carp, but it's not staying around to say hello. And there's two more that won't stay. More swan mussels, an excellent source of food, especially one of this size, which the carp can quite easily crush in their throat teeth. Another crayfish. This one thought it could hide in the blanket weed. At last, a friendly carp. Let's join him for a while.
He's a battered old warrior and will only put up with so much attention. Look at the size of these fish. Let's see if we can catch one on a floater.
as it's a sunny day, I think we'll get it straight back. Right. We hope you've enjoyed this film as much as we have. But before you leave us, let's look back at some of the magic moments we've enjoyed while making the Carp Fever series.